We're going to talk about the international reactions to all of the things we've been talking about over the last couple weeks. Italian aggression in the 1930s, but really more so the German aggression in the 1930s. And I want to start us off uh, with the British, uh, because Britain is the most powerful country in Europe. They've got the biggest empire on the planet. They're the ones that are really driving the story in terms of reaction to what Germany and, and uh, Italy are up to. So the British appeasement policy. Let's start here. British appeasement policy. This is the official policy of the British government to react to what we would say are the aggressive actions of Germany and, and to a lesser extent, Italy. Today, the word appeasement in international relations and in international politics is a bad word. All right. One of the guys that espouses this, there were a few British prime ministers, the one you guys need to know is the last one, is Neville Chamberlain. Neville Chamberlain. Unfortunately for Neville Chamberlain's family, Neville Chamberlain has kind of gone down in, in 20th century history as, as, you know, he's not as bad as certainly any of the guys that executed the Second World War, but he is one of the guys that is seen as letting it happen through his appeasement policy. In fact, if we were to Google today, and we can do it later, I can show you, I'm not making this up. If we were to Google the name Neville Chamberlain and Barack Obama, you would see a lot of writers, particularly, or, or politicians or whatnot, particularly on the Democratic side, uh, who would conflate Barack Obama and Neville Chamberlain with each other, saying, saying the Iran deal, if you've heard, heard of anything about that, the Iran nuclear deal that Obama's administration uh, worked out with the nation of Iran. That is just Barack Obama being a modern-day Neville Chamberlain, giving in or appeasing an aggressive state that wants to do bad things. We're giving in to them. To appease is to give in to the demands of someone or something, or in this case, some nation. If you guys have little siblings, if you've ever babysat, you kind of get this concept, right? Like a kid is like, can I have that candy? And you're like, no, you shouldn't have this candy, but I really want that candy. No, you really shouldn't. We're going to have dinner soon. Can I have the candy? And then eventually you, you turn weak. You don't want to fight anymore. And you say, if I give you the candy, will you just leave me alone? And the kid says, yeah, that's all I wanted from the beginning. And you give him the candy. And then he leaves you alone. But of course, what is every person that's ever babysat or anyone that's ever had a kid or a little sibling, what do they recognize? What have we just taught that kid? Okay. They can do it, yeah, yeah. Dad or mom or babysitter, they have a breaking point. And all I have to do is keep needling and eventually I will get what I want if I, if I fight hard enough, if I whine enough. So we might know on a, on a family level that appeasement doesn't work. But for the British in the 1930s, this becomes the hope to avoid that future conflict that everybody wanted to avoid. If we can maybe give in to some of Adolf Hitler's maybe more minor demands, maybe that can keep us out of some future conflict. Maybe it'll make us friendly with Germany going forward so we could avoid any kind of future conflict. So we're going to talk about the appeasement policy. We're going to talk about Neville Chamberlain and how he's connected to it. Uh, but please recognize that this is, it almost sounds like it's a bad word. Like to call it the appeasement policy sounds like we're making fun of it in this day and age. But we only make fun of it. We only know that it was such a bad policy. We only use this to accuse anybody else that ever makes any agreement of wrongdoing because we knew this one worked out badly. When Neville Chamberlain and Britain in 1938 are orchestrating their appeasement policy, what do they not know? They don't know he's lying. They don't know he's going to keep pushing. They don't know he's going to ask for more and more and more. They don't know World War II is going to result. All right? So, and it's not just Barack Obama. Uh, I could Google George W. Bush and Neville Chamberlain, and I will find those that will be arguing that, ne that, that he was an appeaser. Any president, um, if you want to denigrate them, you would compare him to this poor guy from England in the 1930s. So I'm going to give you the rationale for the British appeasement policy. I've got uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis, six, yes. One, public opinion. First, public opinion. 
British people, people in Europe in general, outside of Germany and Italy, British people did not want war. If the appeasement policy was a way to avoid war, good. And guess what? The appeasement policy avoided war until war came, right? Kind of a weird concept. But it works, everything, everything that you try works until it doesn't work, right? But while it's working, it's working, and why would you change it? And we've got to be careful with the people that put like, the, uh, the 2020 glasses on when they're, when they're looking back in time. And, they, and we know how frustrating it is, right? When, when, of course we knew, oh my goodness, wait, wait, let me think of an example in my own life. Um, I've done this before. I, we've got this, we've got a dog, right? And our dog likes to run all over the house. And we don't let the dog go upstairs, so we keep a baby gate uh, up the stairs. And so, so one, time, one day, I was carrying like a glass and something else and something else from upstairs. And we had to do this like kind of weird acrobatic thing over the baby gate. I can take the baby gate down, but that's just hard. So I do this like weird acrobatic thing over the baby gate to get out of there. And, and on this particular time, my hands were full, and I tripped, and I went crashing down and smashed the, the, the bowl or glass or whatever I was holding. And it broke all over the place. My wife was there to let me know that I should have taken the baby gate down. <laughs> now, I've done this 15,000 times over the three years that we've had the dog, right? But on this occasion, yes, I probably should have taken the baby gate down. But me finding out from her after the fact that that was a bad idea isn't really helpful, is it? Right? But we do this. And so we've got to remember as history students that hindsight is 20, 20. It's always really easy after events to know that, Neville, this doesn't work. But until we can invent our time machine, until the flux capacitor is up and working, until we can get enough uh, uh, plutonium from the Libyans, this, that we, we're stuck, right? So public opinion. The people of Europe didn't want a war. Uh, there is, yes, sir. It might have, yeah. So he's like doing the thing that would hopefully not make Hitler angry. He doesn't want war. So I don't know what the... Uh, people are always really good at saying what doesn't work. They're not as good at, at going back and, and, or giving like viable suggestions beforehand. Yes, sir? No, no. It, it just becomes like a, a name you can slander somebody with. Um, one note... World War I is now a generation removed. Do you guys want to sound smart when you're writing? Yes. If you can mention a 20-year time period from 1918, the end of World War I, to 1938. You can also say that that is a generation. A generation is roughly the time it takes for a baby to be born, a baby to grow, a baby to have their own baby. About 20 years, all right? Now, that's weird, because uh, you guys aren't probably looking for babies when you're 20. But remember, for most of human history... Babies were about when you were 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So a generation is about 20, 25 years or so. So a whole generation has passed since World War I. But there's still the memory of how bad that war was. But there's an even more a recent memory for how bad war is in the 1930s. What example of modern war would, co would have convinced people in England that avoiding World War II or avoiding a conflict with Germany is extremely necessary. What? World War I, but something more recent than that. I heard it back here. Very good. The Spanish Civil War. And it was the Spanish Civil War that the Germans sent their Condor Legion of their Luftwaffe over Spain and they rained hell down from above and they destroyed the city of Guernica and the civilians in that city. And people in England got to look at that, and they saw it in the newspaper. We also see it from the 1937 invasion of mainland China from Japan, and the Japanese Air Force raining hell upon Chinese cities. We saw that. We knew what it looked like. And if you're England, if you're British, you went through World War I relatively unscathed. German airplanes weren't flying over southern England. There were some blimps that went over southern England, dropped little bombs on London, but nothing big. But by World War II or by the 1930s, Germany could absolutely fly over southern England and bomb those cities. Even more reason to avoid a war. Reason number two, the demands Hitler was making, especially early on, 
seemed justifiable to many. They made sense. What does Hitler want to do? Rebuild a military? He's got a really small military, hardly enough to even defend his country that is surrounded by countries that might feel threatened by Germany and might have their own large militaries. So maybe it's not that big of a deal to let Adolf Hitler rebuild his military. Adolf Hitler wants Anschluss with Austria? Austria is, uh, is, is German. Germany, or Germans are German. They maybe should all be together. Who cares, right? Uh, he wants to remilitarize the Rhineland. He wants to put German soldiers in another part of Germany. That doesn't seem unreasonable, especially a generation after World War I had come to an end. Three, there is no strong alternative to the appeasement group. To those politicians that believe in appeasement, they make up a majority of the government. There is no strong opposition. There is no opposition party to appeasement. British politics are largely divided by uh, two main parties, a labor party, which is like the liberal left party, and a conservative party. Um, Neville Chamberlain was, was a labor guy. But even many members of the conservative party supported the appeasement policy for all the reasons we've already talked about. One name that you want to keep in the back of your mind that didn't, uh, I can't write anymore, Winston Churchill. We are going to talk much more about him going forward. He was a vocal opponent to this appeasement policy in the 1930s. One of the few opponents of the appeasement policy in the 1930s. Spoiler alert for next week. Winston Churchill will be the next Prime Minister of England after Neville Chamberlain resigns. Poor Neville Chamberlain. He learns that the appeasement policy fails. Germany invades Poland. Germany invades Denmark. And then Germany invades Norway. Chamberlain quits. He, he, he steps down. He resigns. And forevermore, he's seen as one of the biggest failures of international politics of the 20th century. How about, let's give a, maybe he hears us right now. Let's give a collective, aw, for Neville Chamberlain. Okay, because I, I, I kind of feel he tried. Right, but it wasn't really his fault, I mean, like, like, what other it wasn't his fault, and he had no good options, but he gets the blame. He gets so much of the blame, and that's why we go, aw, it does. It's kind of like Neville Longbottom to Harry Potter. Like, he always gets blamed for everything. I wonder if uh, J.K. Rowling had a reason for naming him Neville. Okay, anyway. Number four. Number four. The Great Depression is still a thing. The Great Depression is still a thing. It's still a thing. By 1935, 36, 37, 38, it is still a thing. And so a country that is still mired in a depression you can't afford to, to mobilize for war. That's very expensive. So you want to avoid military conflict because you're still dealing with an economic crisis. Five, the sun never sets on the British Empire. That means the sun is never setting on the things England has to concern itself with. Hong Kong, India, the mandates of the British Empire in the Middle East, Palestine, they're still keeping an eye on half of Africa. This is where Britain has to concern itself on a global scale. They don't want a war in Europe that would disrupt all of that. And then the last, Neville Chamberlain, especially by the time he's Prime Minister in 1938, he is strongly influential. He is an anti-war guy, like many others. He's an anti-war guy. And he has little faith at this point in the League of Nations or any other countries to support Britain or to, to help them if any conflict does come. So he's going to try to work out deals with Adolf Hitler on his own. Because he has, unfortunately, we now know, a misguided belief that Adolf Hitler could be worked with, that Adolf Hitler could be trusted. We know that that's not the case. But Chamberlain doesn't know until he, Hitler proves himself to not be trustworthy. And then after that, all of the I told you so's will come out, right? I told you you shouldn't have trusted Hitler. 
But they didn't know. They couldn't have known that until we really learned not to trust the man. Okay, good. I'm going to talk briefly about France. Very briefly. France can only do what England wants to do. Or Britain wants to do. France is certainly threatened by Germany. France does not want to see a, a rearmed Germany. But if Britain is not going to fight, if Britain is not going to stand up to Germany, France is not going to do it on their own. Remember, World War I was a victory for France and Britain and the United States. But it was only a victory because Britain and later the United States and earlier Russia was in on that alliance. France would not have defeated Germany if it was just France versus Germany. So France can't go it alone. France can't go it alone. They're only going to do what, what Britain does. Good? Good. That covers where Britain is at and a little bit where France is at. Two, with regard to the responses to these aggressive actions, the League of Nations, we know what that's all about by the 1930s. It is weak. It is ineffectual. It can't get anything done. It lacks the, the economic power and the resources, military and otherwise, of the United States. The fact that we never joined the League of Nations from its beginning permanently weakens that league. And also, please remember that if any, if the League, what's that? No, no military for the League of Nations, right. Please remember that if any League of Nations action wanted to put, like, say, economic sanctions on a country for whatever they had done, the United States doesn't have to follow that. So the League might take trade away from a country like Germany, but the United States could just fill in that gap. So it makes everybody weaker, except for the U.S. and, and Germany in that case. They've already proven themselves to be weak in the face of aggressive actions. What are the two examples we talked about? Japan with their invasion of Manchuria, and then Japan and their invasion of mainland China in 1937. Manchuria was 31. And then what's the other? The Ethiopian or Abyssinian crisis back in 1935, 30, or 36 and 37. The reality is, and, and Chamberlain knows this, countries are motivated, they're driven by their own self-interest. They do what's best for them. We still do that. They do what's best for them. They don't necessarily, they, they don't look at the league and say, we all have to maybe sacrifice for the good of the league. They're still just doing what's best for them as individual nations. Cool, Leo? Cool. United States. We have an Atlantic Ocean separating us from European problems. And so we're staying out of it. We are an isolationist nation. From 1935 on, the United States will pass a series of neutrality acts. We will talk about these more next week. From 1935 on, we pass a series of neutrality acts, which will keep the United States... Uh, pledge the United States to stay out of any foreign conflicts. So if war comes, we aren't going to be in it. For the Soviet Union, where are they? Sadly, for, uh, for our story here, the Soviet Union and their leader, and who's the leader of the Soviet Union in the 1930s? Joseph Stalin, he's a guy we're going to get to, to know pretty well through World War II and the Cold War. Joseph Stalin is, and, and this is like historians write about this today, so it's seen as, okay, this is an actual trait that Joseph Stalin had. This is not just me being like kind of slamming Joseph Stalin um, in, while he's in his grave. Uh, Joseph Stalin was a little paranoid. Joseph Stalin believed people were out to get him, all right? And he had to watch his back, and he had to keep an eye on, on who he trusted around him. And so while Joseph Stalin would not like Adolf Hitler and the Nazis, he saw as his bigger threat at the moment in the 1930s the Western powers, the United States, Britain, the Western capitalist powers. It was the League of Nations, led by Britain, that didn't invite the uh, Soviet Union to join that League of Nations. The Soviet Union would not be a part of the League until 1934. So the League was around for 14 years 
before the Soviet Union is led into it. 1934. The Locarno Treaties, Soviet Union not invited. The, uh, the, the Munich Conference in 1938, Soviet Union is not invited. The Soviet Union is not being considered in these discussions about European interests. They feel like they're being frozen out. So Joseph Stalin, and he proves this, would rather work out a deal with Germany than have any agreement or work out any deals with the Western powers. Yes? He said he wasn't the right to the or... or the Munich Conference in 1938. Yep. All right, good. So we kind of handled their, their, the major players in the world at the time. Now let's talk about what actual things these players, or Britain, or others, did through each step of German and Italian aggression. First, with regard to German rearmament. Remember, Germany was only, according to the Treaty of Versailles, allowed to have how many uh, troops? 100,000. Air Force? None. None. Uh, Navy? Yeah, just six battleships and, and no submarines whatsoever. Well, Germany was rearming. Under Adolf Hitler's leadership, they were rebuilding their military. And for the British, many of them accepted that. Like, this is not something we're going to go to war over. Germany should be able to have a military. Can't fight them over this. Too far removed, and we're in the Depression. It's not something we can deal with. And actually, Britain will be complicit. To be complicit is to, like, support something to happen, right? They will be complicit in 1935 by signing what's called the Anglo-German... Naval Agreement. 1935, the Anglo-German Naval Agreement. Britain hopes to avoid a costly arms race. If Germany's rebuilding their military, and then Britain's got to get bigger, and then Germany's got to get bigger, and then Britain's got to get bigger, and we end up with, with what happened at the beginning of World War I, where Germany and Britain were both competing and building bigger and bigger navies. Britain wants to avoid that. So they agree to meet with Adolf Hitler in Germany, and out of this meeting comes the Anglo-German Naval Agreement, where Britain will allow Germany, in violation of the Treaty of Versailles, they're essentially telling Germany, yes, yeah, sure, violate the Treaty of Versailles, do what you've got to do. They're going to let Germany build a navy, a, su a surface fleet, that is 35% of the size of the British fleet. So the British fleet is the, the biggest, most powerful navy on the planet. Germany gets to have a fleet that's one-third that size, 35%, a little bigger than a third. Do you guys recall the Washington Naval Conference after World War I that created the ratio of 5, 5, 3, 1.75, 1.75, right? United States and Britain, France, Italy and Japan, and then wah, wah, pretty much Germany, right? Virtually no navy for Germany. Well, this is going to turn that over right away. Germany can now openly rebuild a navy. And not only can they have a navy that is 35% is the size of the British fleet, they can build it any number of submarines that they want to. Please don't think about how we know what Germany is going to do with those submarines. All right? They didn't know it at the time. They wanted to have good relations with Germany, so let them build them. Yes? Um, my question was, what, what's the significance of signing the treaty? Like, what does that mean? Could they have done it secretly? They, they could have done it, sure, certainly. And they already, they already had built an air force secretly. But by getting Britain to sign off on this... To a, by, by having Britain, one of the victors of World War I, one of the drivers of the Treaty of Versailles, agree to sign off on this, what does that do to every other provision of the Treaty of Versailles? If that can be broken, they can all be broken. So to do this out in the open, to have a public declaration, essentially, that the Treaty of Versailles doesn't mean anything anymore, that's what, what, what the cause is. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. France has to, has to kind of toe the line, all right? 
Now let's change, uh, uh, change the story to uh, Mussolini's invasion of Abyssinia. After Italy moves into Abyssinia, the, the world at large and the League of Nations condemn Italian actions. But remember, condemnation doesn't necessarily mean action. So we can, we can flap our gums a lot, we can talk a lot about it, but it didn't mean they did anything uh, to militarily remove Italy. The League would impose limited economic sanctions. Remember, economic sanctions are these economic punishments. We still use these as tools today. One of the you guys following the story about the Iran nuclear deal? And now Donald Trump is asking Congress to, to look at it and maybe further sanctions should be put on Iran. This is the debate going on now. So economic sanctions are always a possible punishment before going to war. Problem here, though, is not all nations of the League are going to follow through with those sanctions. Remember, nations of the League of Nations, what drives them? Their own self-interest, yes. Italy, for invading Abyssinia. Because they just do what they're going to do. Like, well, the League of Nations is telling... Have you ever, like, not listened to something your parents told you to do or not do? Well, how could you do that? They told you not to. They just don't do it. Well, no, it's not, not the, the money from Italy. It's like an economic sanction might be, hey, countries of the League of Nations, don't sell Italy things that can be used for weapons of war or whatever. Don't ship Italy food stuff or whatever. But you'll, you're going to do it because you want to do it. And, and what are you going to do about it, League, if I don't listen to you? Remember, the League of Nations told Japan to get out of Manchuria. And what did Japan do? They left the League of Nations. The League of Nations really has no teeth, right? Yes, ma'am. Abyssinia is Ethiopia. Ethiopia is Abyssinia. I apologize. I'm conflating the two words, but the two words are identical. So if you want to call it Abyssinia or Ethiopia, you do whatever makes you feel good. Uh, but do not mix them up in your own papers. So... The sanctions aren't working because countries like Germany, shocking, are going to violate those sanctions. Britain, what they really want to do is avoid a bigger war. And as a part of the British appeasement policy, and this is obviously going against what someone like Haile Selassie would want uh, from the League of Nations, the British and the French work out what is called the Hore Laval Pact. The Hor Laval Pact. Just the names of the guys that are working out this agreement. And this was a plan to give over much of Abyssinia to Italy. To let them have it in hopes of avoiding a bigger conflict. This is appeasement, right? Giving in to aggressive demands in hopes of avoiding a bigger conflict. Well, the very existence of this plan shows that the League of Nations isn't about protecting all nations. Because remember, Abyssinia was a member of the League of Nations. Haile Selassie went there to plead his case. doesn't matter. They're going to chop it up and give it away to Italy anyway. So out of one side of their mouth, the League of Nations is saying, get out, Italy. Out of the other side, the most powerful nations, Britain and France, are trying to just avoid that bigger war in Europe. So let's just give them Abyssinia. Okay? Question, yes, Jessica. It's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. I know. Stinks for Ethiopia, right? And guess who didn't have any say in the Horror of All Pact? Ethiopia, Haile Selassie. He's not in none of the discussions there. But they didn't worry about that. Just like when the Munich Pact was signed, right? Who wasn't in on the discussions of the Munich Pact? Czechoslovakia wasn't there. They didn't get to decide how their country was going to be given away. Pretty frustrating. Okay, with German rearmament and the remilitarization of the Rhineland. So Germany's rebuilding their military and then moving that military into the Rhineland. Of course, the Treaty of Versailles forbade this, right? Britain and France, they'll do nothing. Britain and France will do nothing. There will be no opposition. But what kind of opposition could there be? Are you going to invade Britain? I mean, pardon me, are you going to invade Germany to stop them from moving troops from one part of Germany to another part of Germany? 
That doesn't seem like something a democratic nation would get behind. And it, ugh, we, we could kick ourselves now. Because if, if Britain and France wanted to stop Germany in 1936, they absolutely could have. That's what's so frustrating about all of this. We could have stopped Adolf Hitler. We could have pushed him back. We could have stopped him from violating the treaties. But to do that would have meant war. And war is not what anyone wanted. We wanted to avoid that. Okay, next, Spanish Civil War, 1937-38. A <coughs> couple of notes about the Spanish Civil War. There are two main factors in this civil war. Two main, or factions. There is, <coughs> there is a government side, and then there is a rebel side. Usually, these are the factions in any civil war, right? Like when we fought our civil war, there was the government side, the United States, Washington, D.C., Abraham Lincoln, and then there were the rebels, the Confederacy that broke away from that. Uh, so there's a government side. In, in uh, the intergalactic civil war of, uh, of Star Wars, there is the galactic empire, right? And then there are the rebels. We've got to caution ourselves, though, being Americans. And we know, uh, like during our original civil war, our war for independence, there was a government side, the King of England, and then there were the rebels, us, right? So we've got to be careful like, like, uh, to assume that the rebels are always good and noble or always bad or whatever. You have to look at each case by its own merits, right? In the Spanish Civil War, so we're going Spanish Civil War, the government side, they were called the Republicans. Kind of like fighting for this idea of the Republic. And on the rebel side, you have the Nationalists. Through many modern civil wars, and, and civil wars really through history, foreign nations often get involved. Because they have a hope. I, wish, I hope this side wins, or I hope that side wins. right? And they might tinker or, or give aid to one side or another in hopes of getting their side to win that fight. Because maybe it'll work out better in the end for their own self-interest. In this case, we've got some foreign nations that are going to get involved. For the Republican side, the Soviet Union is going to send troops and aid <coughs> into the Republican side of the Spanish Civil War. Unfortunately for the Republicans, countries like the United States and Britain and France so don't like the Soviet Union, they don't want to get involved with that. On the other side, Italy, we know that. <coughs> Italy and Germany. Italy's going to send 70,000 soldiers. Germany's going to send their Luftwaffe. And this becomes a proving ground for the new German Air Force. This becomes a place where they can test what modern war is going to look like. And even though Britain and France don't get involved in the fighting of the Spanish Civil War, they're certainly watching from outside. And as we've already talked about today, seeing how the Spanish Civil War looks from the outside is going to keep countries like Britain and France from wanting to get into a bigger war in Europe. Coolio? All right. Anschluss. We remember what Anschluss is. Germany and Austria. The political union between Germany and Austria. Very good. The hills are alive with the sound of music and Anschluss. The British and the French will protest this. They'll say, no, this isn't cool. This wasn't supposed to happen. The Treaty of Versailles, right? We're supposed to not do this. But there won't be any further action. Because what would that mean to stop Germany from taking over Austria? War. No one wants war. And who would you be fighting a war for? To preserve Austrian territory and Austrian lives that aren't being lost. The Austrians aren't fighting. If the Austrians maybe were fighting to defend themselves, it might have been a different story. But they're not. So we're not going to send French sons and British sons to Austria to fight for a country that's not fighting for itself. Plus, what is the greatest strength of the British Empire, the British military? Uh, what is the greatest strength they have? Their Navy. What good does their Navy do in a war in Austria? What do you know about Austria? No, oh, you guys are good. So... Even if Britain wanted to do something about it, to get to Austria, 
you would have to like get across the continent, get your army in a very difficult position in the middle of the continent, in mountains, it ain't happening. So no reaction to Anschluss. Czechoslovakia. We remember how to spell Czechoslovakia, right? If you can do this, C-Z-E-C-H, you've got the rest. For Czechoslovakia, we know Hitler makes his demands for what? Sudetenland. Everybody say that right now so you can hear yourself say it. Sudetenland. 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 I'm not feeling it right now. There we go. All right. So Hitler wants the Sudetenland. Why does he want the Sudetenland? There's German people in it, and he's saying that the Czechs are abusing and mistreating the German minorities in Czechoslovakia. So they should be a part of Germany. Britain and France are looking to avoid Adolf Hitler taking all of Czechoslovakia. They don't want that to happen. So they try to negotiate a solution. This comes through the Munich Conference in September and October of 1938. We've already talked about this. Where Germany will be given the Munich Pact. They'll be given uh, the Sudetenland. But there's, of course, a promise that those four countries that signed the Munich Pact, Britain, France, Germany, and Italy, those four countries that signed the Munich Pact will defend the rest of Czechoslovakia. That's the agreement. Also, at the signing of the Munich Pact, Neville Chamberlain, there he is, Neville Chamberlain and Adolf Hitler signed what's called the Anglo-German Declaration. They signed the Anglo-German Declaration. And this is the agreement between those two countries that they will negotiate, they will discuss any problems that they have. They won't resort to war. The Anglo-German Declaration. And that is what Neville Chamberlain waved in the sky and said, we will have peace in our time. And how did, his, his, uh, how did the British people back at that airport in London, how did they react to him? Yay, thank you for not sending us to war with Germany because we don't want a war with Germany. Coolio? All right. Then Adolf Hitler violates the Munich Pact. In March of 1939, he invades the rest of Czechoslovakia. Remember, Czechoslovakia is now left defenseless. And again, Britain and France pledged to defend Czechoslovakia, but what are they going to do? Because what do you know about Czechoslovakia? It's landlocked. It's hard to get to. In fact, you would have to like fly over Germany to get to Czechoslovakia, and that ain't going to work when you're at war. So then, oh wait, okay, so if you can't fly over Germany, let's fly over Austria to get to... Ch well, wait, no, that's Germany now. Okay, but if you can't fly over Austria, let's fly over Italy to... Oh, jeez. See why this is problematic? And why, how it's e so easy to say for us right now. It's so easy to say that we should have stopped him when he invaded Czechoslovakia. Mm, that's hard to do. How do you actually do that? You have to get armies to the other side of the continent flying over enemy territory. What will the Germans do as you try to fly over their territory? They will shoot you down. It's not going to work, right? Uh, how about we work out a deal with the, with the Russians so we can come from the other side? The Russians are already working out a deal with the Germans. None of this is going to work. In April of 1939, a month after Germany takes all of Czechoslovakia, Benito Mussolini says, when in Rome, do as the Romans. Well, I guess he's always in Rome. But Benito Mussolini said, hey, if I'm on Team Germany, and Team Germany just violated the Munich Pact and took over Czechoslovakia, uh, why don't I play that game as well? In April of 1939, Benito Mussolini will violate his treaty of friendship with Albania. And he will invade Albania, essentially taking that country over. Again, there's, there's condemnation, there's condemnation, but little more. But we do have one change. After Czechoslovakia is invaded and after Albania is invaded, Neville Chamberlain has finally learned what a, an agreement or a treaty or a promise from a dictator means, from Hitler and Mussolini alike. And what are they worth? Nothing. Nothing. They're not worth the paper they're written on. And so this is where Britain will now give a promise, a pledge to Poland. Hey, Poland, we've got your back. Hitler, you better not mess with Poland. And for down in, in southeastern Europe, uh, Greece. Greece, we got your back. 
Italy won't go messing with you because we're going to stand by your side. We make a, we make a promise of defense for those borders of Poland and Greece. But of course, Adolf Hitler's already got this worked out. In August of 1939, in August of 1939, he meets with Joseph Stalin, right? And they will sign the public Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact. And then they will also make private agreements to divide Poland between them and allow the Soviet Union to take other countries in Eastern Europe while Germany was taking countries in Western Europe. Yes? Isn't it so easy to break these treaties? How do these countries like reimburse trust? I know, isn't that weird? Yeah. It's hard. We fought a war with each other. We fought a war with each other and like... Like once we join with, with Britain and eventually join with the Soviet Union, that would help at least during the war. But we will talk through the course of World War II how Joseph Stalin will mistrust the West throughout the duration of that war. On September 1st, 1939, we know that Germany invaded Poland. Immediately the British give an ultimatum to Germany. You should know that word, ultimatum. Young lady, you clean your room or else. That or else is your ultimatum. Whatever mom or dad is saying to you, uh, that is, that's what they're, you, you have to clean your room or else there's going to be this punishment. Germany, there will be war with us unless you immediately withdraw from Poland. You have 24 hours from September 1st. Tick, 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 tick. The clock starts ticking, right? September 2nd comes. Okay, we waited an extra day. September 3rd comes. Germany failed to meet their ultimatum. War is declared by Britain and France against Germany. World War II is on. 